Okay, welcome everyone to the OWASP Austin chapter meeting for July. How's everybody doing today? <laughs> Enjoying the warm weather? So uh, sponsors for today's meeting, uh, the food is sponsored by our last con uh, annual conference and facilities for national instruments. Our chapter leadership, I'm Tiana Chandler, the chapter leader, and we may have a few folks around here today attending uh, Matt, um, I know Matt Snyder, I'm sorry, Josh, and then Matt Snyder's out helping escort people in here to the meeting still. Um, and you can reach out to any one of us if you have any questions about the, uh, the chapter. If you're interested in getting a CPE hour out of attending this, uh, please just email me and I can get you a certificate for that. We have a study group currently going on. It meets every Thursday, although I think we're we're taking we're not going to do it this week, and I think we may be even yeah the 11th is when we're coming back to start, and it's with the basic security testing with Kali Linux 2, the book. So it's it seems to be a very interesting and well-attended uh, study group. As far as memberships go, um, there's uh, several options. That if you can go to austin.os.org, you can see the different types of memberships that are available. Um, you don't have to be a member to attend this because we're an open organization, but um, it does uh, help with our efforts. And uh, also uh, for support uh, for OWASP, uh, we're welcoming any volunteers that may want to help out, um, whether it's in our leadership, um, speaker opportunities, like with this meeting and other things, and uh, uh, with local events. Uh, if you shop using Amazon, um, you can use the smile.amazon.com and uh, select uh, the uh, OWASP Foundation as the uh, uh, where you can get some it gives back to the OWASP organization. Upcoming chapter events, we do have a, a monthly uh, Austin Security Professionals Happy Hour. Uh, it will be the next one coming up is Thursday, August 11th uh, at Sherlock's. And uh, if you're uh, if you're not on the um, Austin the OS Austin mailing list, I would encourage you to do that because uh, we send out emails through there to announce these type of events. And as far as uh, uh, training opportunities, we did have one. And I don't know if Matt, if you wanted to speak to how well that went, was attended and went. Um, And Matt Pardo, our education coordinator, um, he uh, organized that and may be looking at organizing some others in the near future. So uh, just stay tuned for that. Thank you, Matt. Upcoming conferences, um, save the date, November 1st through 4th. It's going to be at the North Conference Center. Um, still in the planning stages and getting things uh, organized. So um, again, if there we there will be uh, volunteer opportunities for that as well. Uh, Griff, I don't know if you want to say anything more about it at this point in time. OK, that's fine. Yeah, thank you. And just listing a, a handful of other upcoming local events. Uh, the, uh, and I'll just, you can just read it there. I don't need to read them out to you. And uh, uh, also, uh, at this opportunity, I wanted to ask if anybody had any announcements for either job opportunities or anything that they wanted to, to uh, mention as far as other events that may be going on. Hi, for those who don't know me, my name is Phil Beyer. I work for a company called the Advisory Board. We have offices in Austin, headquarters in DC, and a few other places around the country. Uh, I have an application security engineer position open right now. 
should be able to find it on the Jobs Board. Uh, I also have a senior position open as well. Uh, so if, if either one of those are appropriate for you, you, that position could definitely report out of our, either one of those could report out of our Austin office. So see me afterwards if, if you have questions or want to know more. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah, I'm Bill Kleinbecker, program, program chairman. Is this wrong? Okay. Okay. Program chairman of Technology Advisors Group. Next, um, our August meeting, last Friday of August, and I can't come up with a date right now, Jim Curtin, who is the CEO of Capstar Forensics, is going to be our speaker. Generally, our, our speakers cover the company story as opposed to anything really technically technical, but you might enjoy that. Um, 7 o'clock in the morning, sorry about that. It's a breakfast, so you can sign up at the Technology Advisor Group meetup. Thank you. Anybody else? And uh, again, more, for more information about uh, the chapter, you can go to austin.oas.org. And now I'd like to introduce to you Josh Sokol, our pre presenter for today. Thank you. Test, test. You guys hear me all right? Cool. All right. All right, so I wasn't the original speaker for today, um, but when uh, the original speaker decided to, that they could not make it, um, I said, I'm happy to fill in. This is a talk that I had given out at uh, B-Sides Austin back in March, I want to say. Um, I've changed a couple things, uh, but the base is there. Um, this talk kind of stemmed out of uh, a panel discussion that I participated on at B-Sides Austin uh, four. Uh, it was really interesting. We we're, were sitting down, there's a you know, group of five or six security people, and we were all kind of talking about, I think the question was a uh, young man, you know, maybe 17 years old or so, he's like, you know, how do I get into InfoSec? And these other guys were all like, you know, you do this studying and blah, blah, and, you know, you should, uh, you know, do your CISST and everything. And I, I kind of thought about it uh, before it got to my turn. I was like, well, it's interesting because I, I think if you look down this row of people, and, and I kind of took a poll in the audience, like, how many of you guys actually started in InfoSec? And the vast majority of the people, I mean, I, I would say well over 90% of the people who raised their hands said, I did not. And so I want to take that, I want to start by taking that same poll here today. So of everybody in this room, how many of you guys did not start in InfoSec? You were a developer, you were a system engineer, yeah, vast majority of the people. Um, so I, I think that's really the case for most of InfoSec. And so when, when we start talking uh, to people, the next generation who's coming up um, and, and is going to be filling roles like Phil mentioned, um, we have to keep that in mind, right? We have to be looking at um, what are the, the pieces that make up an InfoSec professional? How do you get to be in that place? Um, and what are the skills that we should have? And so a lot of this stuff kind of came from my brainstorming after that about how did I get to be where I am today? Um, and I guess for that point, who am I? Um, I'm Josh. Uh, I run the security team here at National Instruments. I've got a very small team. I've got three people. All three of us are in this room today. Um, I am also on the OWASP Foundation Global Board of Directors. I've been active with the OWASP Foundation for almost 10 years now. Um, fantastic organization, as Tian mentioned. We do have membership. It's totally optional. But every time you guys get a membership, it really helps the foundation. It helps our local chapter. Um, and then I, I also I went down this path of risk management, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but that led to creating an open source risk management tool called Simple Risk. Um, so for me, uh, where did this all start? Well, it kind of started back in the 90s, right? This is the era of Zach Morris, uh, the Fresh Prince, Bart Simpson. Uh, and it was kind of the rise of the internet, right? Um, my dad was really uh, pretty technical, uh, especially for being a lawyer. Uh, he was actually the first lawyer in the state of Minnesota to have a website. Pretty cool, right? Um, and he wanted to encourage me uh, to go 
go along that route of technology because he saw it being a, a kind of a next big thing. So he bought me a computer, all right? And that computer had one of these things. Uh, you guys recognize that? Yeah, okay. A anybody not recognize that? Okay, uh, we got one, one, all right. He, he admits it, all right. Um, so for you, sir, uh, this is a modem. Uh, it's kind of like the cable modem uh, that you guys uh, have in your, your, um, your home today. Um, way, way slower. Uh, this is a 28.8 modem, and they actually got slower than that. You actually know what it is. I know. I'm, we're, we're kidding. It's, it's okay. It's okay. Um, so, so it's way slower, right? Because this guy went over your telephone line. Um, and so I started playing with this thing, and I, it turned out that there was this local kind of newspaper -y thing uh, in Minnesota that if you picked it up, and you could pick it up for free, it's kind of like the Chronicle, um, in the very back it had something like this where it's basically just a list of a whole bunch of BBSs, right, bulletin board systems, and it gave you a bunch of phone numbers, and we even tell you, like, this dude is the guy who runs this thing. Really interesting, right? Um, and so I grabbed a copy of that thing, I went home with my 288 modem, um, and I started calling these phone numbers. Really weird, because then you started getting something like this, right? And you would look at that thing, and you would have this electronic mail. What the hell is electronic mail? Oh, email, right? Yeah, um, you would have things like uh, the ability to download files, and you could play games like this. Anybody know what the, what game that is? Anybody? No? Zork. Zork. Um, it was completely text-based, and you would have to like move left, and then the guy would move left, and it would give you a new um, a new text, right? Go south. Um, those kind of things. And so I, I got into this world of, of bulletin board systems and talking with people online and whatnot, the kind of stuff that you tell your kids not to do today because of child predators and things like that. That's what I was doing way back then. From that point, uh, my parents um, got a, a subscription to America Online, right? And this was like the portal to the Internet. Um, but for me, it was actually the portal to hacking um, because I started finding these these froggies, right? That's what they called them back in the day. That's what the, the leap kids called them. Um, and I found things like AO Help. Um, great tool, right? You could send uh, phishing. Back before it was known as phishing, you could send phishing attacks to get people's uh, AOL credentials, get their accounts to be able to log in. Um, you could send uh, you know, massive amounts of email. Um, that's that little mass mail thing in the top there. Uh, mass IMs, that was really funny if somebody pissed you off online, you'd just be like mass IM and send them a thousand things and their computer would crash. It was great, right? Um, and this is this was really my, my introduction to the, the, the black side of hacking, right? The, the naughty things that you could get into there. And then it, it got a little bit darker from there. Uh, mail bombs, you guys remember mail bombs? You'd enter somebody's email address and hit send, it would send them like a thousand messages. And at that point in time, like computers were so slow, if you sent a thousand messages, it would just like toss over. You'd have to delete them all, and yeah. So that that was that was the early days. And then I found this thing called IRC, which is still around, right? Um, but it's not around in the way that it was back then. Um, back then, it was all about like bots, right? You could run this bot, and you could have a channel, and you could have your bot in the channel, and anytime somebody joined the channel, the bot would kick them out. And you were like king of the mountain. It was awesome, right? And then they have war scripts. And I remember this one war script that I had that, like, I don't know what it was doing, right? To this day, I still don't know what it was doing. But it would, like, yell at you, net divide. And you'd be like, oh, cool. And then you'd, like, click a button. And all of a sudden, like, everybody else would get kicked out of the chat room. And it was just you. It was awesome, right? <sighs> net split? Is that what it was? Net split. See? He knows. It was awesome. Yeah, I mean, it really, I wasn't that young, but yeah. So it went from there. You guys remember WinNuke, right? This is a CEH, still teaches you WinNuke, by the way. So it's a very current certificate. Um, WinNuke, right? Where if you got somebody's IP address, which you, you could get from IRC, you'd be like, oh, that person signed in on this IP, and you didn't like that person, you just WinNuke them off the face of the Internet. It was awesome, right? They they disappeared. You're like, all right, cool. Now I can talk to that girl in the chat room, and I don't have that person talking, at me, right? It's awesome. All right. So this talk is all about lessons learned. It, it, it's it's about how I came from from that to today, 
And so I, I think our first lesson from all this is really there's a fine line, right, between illegal and unethical, right? And in InfoSec, we walk this line every single day. We're doing all sorts of things, like testing, right? We, we do testing, maybe white box, maybe black box, right? But if you're on a website and you enter something into, let's say, a, a name field on there, like Robert Drop Table Student, right? White hat, black hat? I don't know. Do I own the website? Do I have a, a get out of jail free card so that I don't get sued, right? It also comes into play when we're talking about full disclosure versus responsible disclosure. Because if I just, if I find a vulnerability, right, super leap vulnerability gets me access to all these systems, and I just go full disclosure on that, I'm putting people's lives at risk, their, their livelihood, their systems, their, you know, data, right? So this is a line that, that we walk very, very frequently as InfoSec professionals. So, as I grew older, I, uh, I made a decision. And that decision was that I didn't want to be that kid, right? I didn't want to be the kid in the orange jumpsuit with the, the like, two big guys behind me. Um, as a minor, right, I could, I could do those things and not really worry about the repercussions. But as I got older, it was like, how do I do this? I, I had this thirst for knowledge, but how do I do that without getting in trouble? And so for me, it was really about reading. It, it was about educating myself. It was about, you know, reading things like, uh, you know, the uh, Carolyn Minnell's Guide to Mostly, Mostly Harmless Hacking, the happy hacker she was known as. Um, it was, you know, looking at 2600. Uh, you could go to the local bookstore and sometimes pick that guy up. Um, anarchist cookbook, right? Um, it was as, as much things that I could get my hands on that kind of satisfied that thirst for knowledge. So our, our second lesson here is take every opportunity you get to learn new things, right? Stay away from the dark side. And I think this is really, this is what OWASP is all about. This, this is the nature of OWASP, is you guys are here because it's a fantastic opportunity for us to learn. And in OWASP, we learn things that could be used for good or for bad. Right? It's all about the, the individual. It's all about what you choose to do with that data. So take those opportunities, but please, please go, go to the, the light. Right? So from that point, you know, I, I graduated high school. Right? Still 90s, by the way. Um, I'm, I'm dating myself a little bit here. Um, but I, I decided that I really liked computers. Right? And I liked them enough to, to make a career out of them. So I decided to go to the University of Texas. Uh, I went there for computer science. Um, fantastic school, right? I, I'm not going to say uh, any, any bad things about UT Austin, because uh, I loved it. I, I truly had an amazing experience there. I learned a ton. But what I didn't learn at UT Austin was hacking. I didn't learn anything about security in any one of those classes. Well, there was a networking class where I learned about access control lists, and that was pretty awesome, right? But, but I didn't learn about hacking, which is what I really wanted to learn about. Um, what I did see is a lot of dudes uh, in the computer lab playing with their floppy disks, right? And for me, that didn't really satisfy that, that thirst for knowledge. Um, they were writing programs like this. What I did learn in, in UT for computer science was things about how to program in Pascal, and how to program in C++, and how to program in Java, and you get the idea, right? Um, so I, you know, one thing that I really took away from this was our kids, right? My kids, your kids. I think that we really need to teach them at an early age what computers are all about, what writing code is all about. Um, we need to get them interested in this thing because, frankly, it's the future, right? When, when I look at my daughter and I'm like, you know, you could flip burgers at McDonald's or you could be replaced by a robot at McDonald's, like, where do you want to fall? Well, if you're going to be replaced by a robot, you might as well be the person programming the robot that's going to replace somebody else, right? So we need to be teaching our kids not only how to code, but we need to teach them the morals and ethics from the start so that they don't wind up going down that black path, right? We want them to go to the light side. And that means that secure development needs to be part of every curriculum and needs to be reflected in grading. And that's not just at UT Austin, right? That is for every single computer science program across the world, but that's also at the high school level, 
right? That's at the elementary level because, frankly, at, at this age, at elementary age, the kids are getting exposed to computers. And it's up, up to us to determine what that exposure looks like. Um, all that writing code was less useful uh, as soon as I decided to become a system administrator after I graduated. Um, so I guess you could say I, I really took the long road to InfoSec, like many of you guys. You know, I, I came out with that BS in computer science, and then I, I did like seven companies in seven years before I found my way here to NI. Right? Now, I did a lot of system administration. I did some web system engineer work. And what I came to realize is that this, this exposure to a lot of different things, it's kind of a double-edged sword, right? It, it had good things and bad things. On the good side, I got to dabble in security at pretty much every job I've ever had. Because as a system administrator, like, security is part of your job. You kind of have to know, like, use SSH and not tell them, right? Um, and that very diverse background means that you can be more helpful in a lot of different areas, right? So I have my CCNA, and I knew network stuff that some of the other system administrators didn't. This is useful. Knowing how the OS works in the background, because I had to write a, a freaking bash shell, it's useful. And I earned the trust and respect of people as a leader in those areas before I ever took on this role as security guy. Right? The bad part was that, that it was dabbling in security. right? So I, I spent just enough time to piss some people off and to move on. It was like, hey, here's a vulnerability, now I gotta go back to my system administration stuff, right? Good luck with that. The diverse background meant a lot of time was wasted, frankly, on things that I wasn't passionate about, right? And then it took really a long time for me to get to the point where I was doing what I wanted to do. I've been running the InfoSec program for uh, about six, six and a half years now. We already talked about that. Um, I, I was uh, I was telling uh, one of my managers uh, uh, about this, right? So I, I was working at New Braunfels Utilities. I was a system administrator there, and I I, I had a manager who was just truly a terrible manager. Um, he took all the work that I had done and claimed it as his own to his boss. Um, he basically was. He was just an asshole, right? Former Marine, whatever. Not, not that Marines are assholes, but this guy was, was an asshole. And, you know, I, I, uh, my experience there really made me realize, uh, and especially my experiences after that really made me realize um, that it takes a really shitty manager, right? Seeing, seeing, like, the absolute worst that I can get to show you the traits that make a really good one. Right? When you see this guy and you know this is how he operates and whatnot, man, you're, you you learn to really respect the ones who do it well. And so, um, hat tip to to my old manager Dan Walker, um, he did this very well. Right? He I, I likened him to an umbrella, right? Where everybody on his team was kind of huddled under the umbrella, and he held it out over our heads, right? And he made sure that every time there was a problem. Every time one of us was going to get in trouble for whatever, right? We, we forgot to turn whatever service on or, you know, whatever, right? He held that umbrella over his head, over our head. The problem is when you're the manager and you're holding the umbrella over people's heads, right, and the shit storm comes down from above, well, that shit has to go somewhere, right? And, and unfortunately, it kind of rolled off the umbrella and, and onto him in those cases. And so you kind of have to have to learn as you're going along. The good managers are going to hold that umbrella, but they're going to stand under that umbrella with you, right? They're going to make sure that everybody's taken care of, that everybody's, um, yeah. So from there, I moved on uh, to a company called Kids. I was doing this military contract. Um, I, I was working for. Uh, contractor who was working for a computer science corporation who was working for somebody else and I basically I was like five levels below this contract and it was interesting I, I showed up for work my first week it was doing some system administration stuff like I got done with my first week I was like cool you know I'll, I'll probably go back there on Monday funny thing was I got a call on Saturday morning like this is weird it's, it's from the the guy who runs the office 
and he was like, hey, are you coming in today? I was like, Saturday, dude. What are you talking about? He's like, well, you know, uh, we, we got some stuff to do. He's like, you know, can you come in? I was like, well, no, I, I got some stuff to do too, dude. I, like, I, I, I had plans to go see this, this NAM showcase that was in town. And he was like, well, you know, we'd really like you to come in today. Like, well, it, it, can you tell me what you need? Like, I, I've got this cool thing called VPN. Like, I can you know, clicky clicky a few things and then go on my way. He's like, no, no, we we really need you to come in. So I went in, right, being the the good good employee that I was, and I, I sat down at my computer. I was like, all right, what do you guys need me to do? He's like, well, just sit there until we're ready to do the build. All right. So I sat there. You want to know how long I sat there? Probably eight hours. I sat there surfing the web, right? I mean, I, I was getting paid to surf the web. But I, I sat there for like eight hours until finally they were ready to do the build. And they did the build, and everything crashed. And then I sat there for another two hours until they were ready to do the build again. I wasted my whole Saturday, right? It was awful. Now, you want to know why they do this? Because every single hour that I was sitting there surfing the Internet was an hour that they were able to build, right? And so they were billing these guys, and these guys were billing this guys. And so, you know, I was getting paid 50 bucks an hour for this job. Well, the guys up here were charging $500 an hour for me, right? So absolutely, they wanted me to be butt in the seat so that they could get the paycheck off of me. So this was right about the time I, I had just gotten married. Um, and it just, for me, it was like, they don't, they only cared about the hours, right? They didn't care about me as a person. They didn't care about the family. So lesson number six, military contract, they don't care about work. They care about hours, which really sucks when you're starting a family. All right. So then uh, from there, I moved on to a company called Neopost Loop One. Um, Neopost Loop One was a really interesting company. Uh, based, uh, well, they're, they're like a French company or something like that, but they have a, a pretty decent office here in Austin. I got hired on this role as IT manager. I was like, cool, man, I'm finally going somewhere, right? I got manager in my title. I'm, I'm set for life, right? And, and the funny thing was, at Neopost Loop 1, manager really just meant, like, all this IT shit is yours, right? You, you, you know, if, if it has IT in the title, then you take it. They didn't really care about me as a person. They didn't really care about security. Um, they really, they were looking for a scapegoat, really, is, is what it was. They wanted somebody who, when things went wrong, they could point the finger at it, right? And so lesson number seven was IT manager, when you really have nobody to manage, you're just managing things, is really just another way to say scapegoat, right? I think the, the other thing here is don't get wrapped up in a title. Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on, but Titles, it's just that. It doesn't indicate who you are or what you do, right? Or, or what you're capable of doing, for that matter. So from there, I moved on. I joined this uh, cool company called National Instruments. Um, I was hired on as a web systems engineer in 2007. And it was awesome, right? It, it was really weird. But for the first time, I was on a team that actually gave a shit about each other. Like, I, I had these teammates that, that were like, they were cool. When, when I had a problem, I went to these guys and I was like, hey, uh, do you know how to do this? And they're like, yeah, here, let me help you. This is an amazing feeling. Not only that, but like, we would do these team builders and, and it was like laser tag, right? And then we sat down and we played board games together. And it was, it was like awesome. You know, these were, these were people I enjoyed working with. And, and never once did I feel like they were going to try and stab me in the back. It was this amazing feeling. And my manager even let me do some security stuff. He let me allocate some of my web systems time to security. And so that's really, that, that was my first, like, it was 5% of my job, but, like, I'm, I'm doing something that I'm passionate about. And that's when I first got involved in OWA. And that's when I first started booking the meetings here at NI, and I started talking to people. And really, like, this world opened up for me. It, it was an amazing experience. And so, lesson number eight, 
when opportunity comes knocking, don't just stand there. Open the damn door, right? You have a, an opportunity to do something amazing. Take it. So at first it, it was like, you know, the, the kid at the fire, uh, at the water fountain, right? You know, a little bit of water, but man, that girl's devouring it like a champ. And that was me. You know, a little bit of, of security was coming my way, but every single piece of security, I ate it up. It was awesome, right? Um, I had Qualys at the time, and I, and I was, you know, eliminating these vulnerabilities. This is, this is real charts from way back then, right? You can see where we were when I first started. We were at that the four, right, security risk. And that's on a one through five scale, by the way. It's not like one through 100. It was bad. And so I started fixing these things, and I, I at this point in time, it was just me. So I'm, I'm working on stuff that I have the ability to influence. And I got down to this, like, magical two bar. And that was, like, two was my magic number. If I could have the security risk average at two, it was amazing. So you'll see, like, kind of dips and, and peaks and whatnot, right? But the cool thing is I had metrics, right? I was keeping track of what I was doing. And when it comes to showing people that what you're doing is valuable, this is what you have to do in order to do that. So lesson number nine, you can talk all you want about improvement, right? You can talk about how we're going to make things better and, and do this thing that's going to whatever, right? But it really doesn't mean anything if you can't prove it with metrics. So everything that you do in InfoSec, think about how do I metricize this? How do I turn into something that I can show management that I'm actually, with the, the time that I'm allocating, that I'm doing something that's worthwhile? All right, so from here, like, okay, well, I've, I've got these developers, and my developers don't really, they're, they're like me, frankly. You know, when I went to school, I didn't have that InfoSec background. They, they didn't either. And so I was like, okay, well, how do I, how do I share this with them? How do I, I, you know, teach them some of the stuff that I've been taught? And so I did this office hour thing. It was cool. Like, I, I scheduled two, three hours in the afternoon, one day a month. And I sent out an email to everybody. I was like, hey, I'm going to be doing office hours in this day. And I'd actually get my ass out of Mopac A, which is the building over there. I'd come over to building B, which is the building where all the developers sit. And I would find an empty cube over there and I'd sit down. And some days I felt like this guy, where I was just sitting there all by myself. So it was very zen, right? Um, but the cool thing was, it didn't matter if somebody was in my cube or not. People saw me, right? They were walking by and saying hi. They knew I was the security guy, right? So they knew I was there, and they saw me as the security expert. And what that did is it, it set that level of expectation where if they had a problem, if they actually had something to talk to me about, they knew who to talk to, right? So lesson number 10 here, all the knowledge in your head is really worthless unless you use it to help other people. Right? You, you, can, you can try and be the, the person who takes it all on your shoulders. You can try and be the, that like, subject matter expert and tell everybody else, what, uh, everybody else what to do. Or you can be the person who shares that knowledge with everybody else and tries to make them better people. Right? So security was my passion, and I wanted to do it full time. So what I had to do is I had to make a business case. Right? I had to make a case to the business as to why I should be the one, why I should be the person that they choose to work full-time on security, still 5% of their time. So I, I laid out some charts, right? And I was like, look, total number of vulnerabilities going down. And I was like, look, security risk average going down. Notice the nice trend line there, right? And then, and, and, and then I was like, oh, discovered vulnerabilities going down. And, you know, I kind of went through this because Security is my passion, right? I wanted to show them that I'm, this is something that not only am I passionate about, but I can make a difference. And then I showed them this slide. I said, why me? Why do you want to choose me as the security guy for National Instruments? I said, first of all, I'm proven, right? I have 5% of my spare time that I, I could allocate towards security. But in that little tiny 5%, I've already made some very significant gains for it. Imagine what I could do if I was allowed to focus entirely on security. And I said passion, number two. In general, people will work harder if they're happy with the things that they're passionate about, right? And so everything that I did for two and a half years, I did be, not because somebody asked me to do. It was because I wanted to improve NOS. 
And then the third point is that I'm rational. Right? I don't look at security as a roadblock. And I would encourage all of you to do the same thing. Right? Security is a collaborative effort that takes the current processes into account and it builds on them. It's a building block. And I said, look, you will never, never see me use security as a stick to beat over the beat people over the heads with. Because that's not who I am, and that's not how I believe security should be. So you guys know the rest, right? I got the job. But there was a caveat. And that caveat was you are going to take on SOX and PCI responsibility as your primary responsibility, right? And then everything else is you can do in your spare time. Okay? Sounds a little bit like a deal with the devil, right? But, all right, PCI and SOX, I'll do it because it gets me closer to the, the place that I love, right? And now comes the, the big question, job title, right? What do I want to call myself? And I is an interesting place, right? Um, chief anything. There are basically two people at NI that have chief in their title. There's our CEO, Dr. Truchard. He's been here literally since the company was founded. He is one of the founders. And there's our CFO slash COO, Alex Davers. And he's been here a very, very long time, very well trusted, whatnot. So I know you guys are like, you should go after the chief information security officer title, right? Yeah, that 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 wasn't happening, right? Um, what about security manager, right? Lots of people have security manager in their title. Manager at NI, it's got a, a, a connotation all its own, right? Manager at NI is is like you you've got people underneath you and whatnot. So that really wasn't something, and so I. I started brainstorming. I was like, okay, how do I come up with like a title that, that I could name myself what I want? But how do I come up with a title that that says I I own security without saying that I manage security or I'm the chief of security? And eventually, I settled on information security program owner. Right, owns the information security program. Okay, cool. So, uh, lessons from this. Uh, the first thing. When it comes to compliance, which was my, my initial mandate, um, I learned something interesting. Uh, compliance gets kind of a bad rep. Um, people think of compliance as that big stick. But there's ways to do it where you don't have to do that. And so I feel like compliance and security kind of go hand in hand. If you do it right. You can use compliance as an opportunity to educate people on the right way to do things. And you can be the carrot instead of the stick. Right? The other thing I learned uh, with respect to the title, what's in a name? Right? Shakespeare said best, that which we call a rose by any other name would smell sweet. It doesn't really matter if I have the CISO title or the security manager title or you know janitor title for that matter. It matters what I'm doing. Because for me, this, this is about the passion, right? This, this was, I like security, I want to do security. So who cares what I'm, I'm calling myself? Now I'll caveat that with, when it comes to kind of the, the community, it takes a little bit more convincing to make people realize like, you're the guy in charge of security when you don't have one of those titles they're expecting, right? Because they look down the list of, you know, here's this guy, he's the CISO, and this guy, he's the CISO, and then this guy, he's the owner, what, right? Takes a little bit more convincing, but eventually, you know, you, you say it enough times, people start to believe that it's like the new hotness. Right? We should all be security owners. So, I, I kind of focused in on that that rational thing, right? Security shouldn't be a roadblock. It's a collaborative collaborative effort that takes the current processes into account and builds on them. So, on the web systems team, I had a manager, pretty decent manager actually. Um, but he said no to a lot of people without really listening to their needs, right? Um, what ended up happening is he was trying to protect us. He didn't want us to, to have more work than we could do. Um, for that, I respect him a lot. But what ended up happening is he kind of pissed people off, right? And instead of, you know, just like going off all disgruntled and, you know, saying, well, we, uh, we're not going to do that, 
They look for other ways to get what they want done, right? And they actually bypass the team to do it. And to this day, the, the team, the web systems team, still has people who, who think certain things about them because of the way that manager acted. And that was, you know, six years ago or something, seven years ago. So in my mind, this came down to how do I create an information security program that utilizes a collaborative effort? taking into our, our current processes into account, and then build upon them, right? And so I, I came up with two things really needed to do. The first one is I need to be seen as a security subject matter expert, right? People need to know when it comes to InfoSec, that's the guy to talk to. And the second one is that people should want to talk to me, right? And what that means is that they can't fear me. Because if they fear me, if they think that I'm going to pull out that stick, and we got bigger issues, right? Then, then we were going to have all sorts of communication issues. And it was right about this time that, that I, I kind of uh, entered this period of self-awareness. And I, I wanted to, to try and figure out how do I better myself? How do I prepare myself for this journey? And I came across this book, right? How to Win Friends and Influence People. I did a whole talk on how to win friends and influence people at a couple different conferences. It's amazing. Um, I highly, highly recommend it. It was, it was a book that was written for salesmen. But let's be honest, you all are salespeople, right? You guys are always trying to sell something, whether it's yourself or your ideas. You are always trying to sell something. And so Dale Carnegie, uh, one, of the, one of the pieces of his book is on being a leader. And this section is, is called How to Change People Without Giving Offense or Arousing Resentment. And he lays out these nine things. Begin with praise and honest appreciation, right? So tell people you're doing a good job. I appreciate the work that you're doing. Even if they're not, like, amazingly fantastic at, at security, try and find the things that they are doing really well at and praise them for that, right? Call attention to people's mistakes indirectly. Don't just be like, dude, you're a big fuck up. I don't know why you did that, right? You're indirectly. Talk about your own mistakes before criticizing the other person. It, it takes a lot to admit when you're wrong, um, but we all do, right? We're, we're all fallible. Um, we, we all are going to make mistakes. It's just a part of being human. So if you are willing to swallow a little bit of your pride and talk about the things that you did wrong in the past, it means that you can go forward uh, as a much better person. It means that you can find things that you can relate on. Ask questions instead of giving direct orders, right? Oh, you know, what do you think would be the best way to do that, right? Oh, that's an interesting perspective. Um, have you considered this, right? Guide, don't direct. Um, let the other person say faith, right? Nobody wants to be the, the person who's just like, shit, I can't believe I did, right? You, you, you want to give them the opportunity to, to kind of come around and, and you know, win-win scenario, right? Praise the slightest improvement and praise every improvement. Um, he said, be hearty in your approbation and lavish in your praise. Um, give the other person a fine reputation to live up to. Don't talk down about your peers. Talk up about them. Tell, tell other people about the awesome things that they've done. Right? Use encouragement. Make whatever faults there are seem really easy to correct. And make the other person happy about doing the thing that you suggest. I think this is really key when it comes to emphasis. If you're trying to use that stick approach and you're trying to beat people down, they're never going to be happy about what you're telling them to do. Never. Right? There's always going to be the, in the back of their mind, they're always going to be saying, man, that fucking security guy is making me do this shit again. Right? You want to be the person who, who they're like, yeah, you know, he came in, he told me I was doing a really good job with this, and he suggested let's work on this. And, right? You want them to say good things about you because you want other people to hear those good things and come to you too. So for me, the lesson out of all this, is that change is difficult, but not changing is fatal, right? You have to understand where your flaws are, where your faults are, and you have to figure out how to move beyond them. And if you can't recognize that you have those faults or those flaws, then you can't move. And then the next lesson is ask people about their requirements before you start talking about security, right? In security, there's a, a trade-off between usability and security in almost every situation. You can't talk about security. You can't even start mentioning security until you 
understand what the requirements are there. Then you can start to fit the security piece in. You know, the, the cool thing about all this stuff, all, all the, the self-improvement, it works, right? I started talking to people. More people started coming up to me and asking me questions. They were seeing me as the security subject matter expert. And from that point, it wasn't like the little girl, you know, trying to gobble up as much water as it could. It was like drinking from a fire hose, right? And, and this is kind of how I feel today, right? Everybody wants some security pieces. Now it's how do I justify adding more people to the team so that we can handle all these things that are coming our way. And now the biggest issue they have is, is prioritization, right? Where do I start? Do I do vendor security uh, evaluations? Do I do architecture? Do I focus on vulnerabilities in our system? Um, my VP asked me to look at the NIST cybersecurity framework, right? Oh, th those systems are infected with malware. We need the incident detection response. We've got compliance mandates. Like, where do I focus? Right? And the, the conclusion that I've come to on this is that risk management is, is really the way to prioritize. And so lesson number 15 is when you're evaluating security issues, risk management is how we help to justify what to work on first. It becomes a, a, a simple math problem, really. You look at all the different things that are out there. You look at the risks that are involved with, with each of those different things. And you say, OK, well, the highest risk and the um, least amount of effort is going to be that thing. And so that's what I'm going to work on first. And then you get rid of that, and then you move down the list. Simple, right? Now, number 16, risk management is also how we communicate technical security issues with the business and executives. You don't go to a board meeting and say, oh, heart bleed, right? The board's going to be like, oh, we should call an ambulance, right? When you, tell, when you talk to the board, you're like, look, there's this vulnerability, and the risk involved with this vulnerability is that confidential data could get out, right? And they're like, oh, that sounds pretty bad. What should we do about it, right? And as soon as they ask that question, you know you're going in the right direction. As soon as they ask that question, that means that they understood the risk and they're looking for the mitigation. This is what we want. Right? This is why we're security people, because we want people to be looking for the solution. Not a, a pitch at all, right? But free, open source, risk management. All right. Application security program, right? So I. It comes down to like, where do I look first? What do I, what do, I do first? Application security, mostly through my OAuth stuff, seemed to be a good area to focus. And so the first thing was like, okay, well, if they're anything like me, my developers are anything like me, they went to school, they didn't really learn anything about uh, information security, so let's do developer training, right? Let's, let's put it out there and, and say, here's what vulnerabilities are. Cool, really well received. People enjoyed the training. They learned something new. Awesome. All right. So now what do we do? Okay. Let's um, let's get some tools and let's find vulnerabilities, right? And the natural place was all right. Let's start with production because that's code that's already live. And if we find issues there, we need to fix them, right? What do you think is the question that they ask? Right? It's production. The code's already live. Right? There, that vulnerability is there. We need to fix it before it gets to prod. Okay, that's my head. What do I do? Test, right? We'll put this in test. And we will do a scanning tool in the test environment, and we're going to find the vulnerabilities before they get to production. Cool. What do you think they said? We need to know before it's in test, right? Okay. Dev, right? Well, we, we don't always use our dev environment, right? Sometimes we use our local laptops. And we, all right. So then we go to on-demand application stack analysis stuff, right? Now, this, this problem shakes out in so many different ways, and it's all a matter of who you're working with, right? But the, the takeaway from here is really once you develop an appetite for security, once you have people who are actively interested in what you're doing and they start to see value in it, the hunger will grow, and people will want more information and they'll want that information sooner and sooner, right? So if you're doing it right, the demand will increase. 
leading by example. Um, this is important, right? Your security people. And I, I think I, I gave a talk a while back to OWASP about eating your own dog food. This is really just calling that out again. We need to make sure that when people look at us and they look at the practices that we're doing, that it, it, it's, you're truly representing what InfoSec is all about. So if you're the, the InfoSec practitioner who has a post-it note on your computer with the password, right, that's not leading by example. Leading by example is anytime somebody, you know, you're working with somebody and they see you log into the computer, you don't just like, you know, grab out the post-it note from your wallet, you pull up PPAS and you log in with some really complex password and then you, you go there and you're like, man, I don't even know my password, right? And like, wow, that is a security guy, man. He goes out of his way to not know his shit. Somebody could bang him over the head with a wrench and he'd still wouldn't know that password. That's cool, man. I like it. So use really complex and lengthy passwords. Use a password manager. If you have, like, some application that you're using for, like, you know, intake from, you know, customers or whatever, right, use HTTPS. This isn't rocket science. It doesn't really matter what that form does. Lead by example. Um, I know it sucks, right? As a security practitioner, you run metasploits and all sorts of stuff. But use the corporate antivirus. Use the anti-malware. Use the anti-whatever mandated software on your system too. Be a part of the environment. You're not. Uh, you're not a unique special flower that gets you know permissions out of that, right? If you need to run those tools, run on virtual, and that will be the environment that you do it in. Um, also important, don't get hacked, right? That's, that's one really bad way to, to that, that's leading by negative example, right? So lesson 18, eat your own dog food. Right? I, think, I think it's pretty obvious, your security people. Um, this last one, I, I, I think I learned my lesson kind of the hard way. Um, quit being a dick to you, right? Um, and, and this means this means everybody. It, it means you know the the intern that comes in. Um, it means you know that guy who keeps getting infected by viruses and whatever, right? We, we all started somewhere, and that that place where we started was a, a place of little knowledge, right? But if you go up to that person, you're like, God damn it, stop, stop clicking on shit, right? Dude, you know better. Stop that. What's that do? It means that they're not going to look at you as the subject matter expert. They're not going to come to you for advice or for consoling. You know, hold them a little bit while they clean the malware off their computer, right? They're they're not going to do that. They're going to go someplace else. They're going to find somebody else. And if they're scared of talking to you or if they're intimidated, they're going to go someplace else. The best case scenario that you can possibly hopeful hope for is that you may need something from them in the future, and they're going to be like, dude, you're Dick. Like, I'm not going to do that for you. The worst case is that they're going to be hiding these things, right? And they're things that as a security person, you're probably going to want to know about, but they're not going to tell you because they don't trust you. They don't trust the reaction they're going to get. So InfoSec needs to be about education and needs to be about evangelization. It needs to be about showing the value of InfoSec. It needs to be about showing the passion of InfoSec. Um, when it comes to hiring people, uh, you can teach people just about anything. Right? In, in, our, in our field, we're all smart people. Almost everybody in InfoSec, you know, going to college and things like that, right? You can teach people skills. I can teach, I, I can teach my nine-year-old daughter to sit down in front of a mess and pop a server, right? That's not all that leap. What you can't teach them is action. That's something they have to develop on their own. So when it comes to hiring people, for me, I look for that passion. I don't look for the person who knows how to run Metasploit. I can teach them how to do that. I want somebody who's like, man, I love running Metasploit, right? I do that shit in my sleep. And so that's lesson 19, right? You want to hire people that eat, that sleep, that breathe security. Because those are the ones who are in it because they love it, not because it's a means to a paycheck. You want the people who go outside of work and they're setting up firewalls in their house and, and uh, you know, writing tools to do whatever. Those are the people that you want to hire. They will get way more done because they enjoy doing it 
And in all honesty, it'll be hard to pry them away. And then lesson number 20, this is the last one, right? InfoSec is fun, right? I, I'm here because I enjoy it. I hope you guys be passionate about what you do, right? Show other people the passion that you have in InfoSec, and they will share it with you. I promise you that. Thanks. Question? What am I CEO of? Um, so, uh, Simporis, the, the risk management software. So, um, went out, created a free open source tool, and then all of a sudden people wanted to buy it from me. And that, that's the best position to be in. Yeah. Cool. I, I, I do give it away. I, I, I literally give it away. Other questions? Yeah. All right. Thank you all. Thank you very much. And uh, we're going to have a a drawing for a book here. So, um. uh, so Shrikar. Venakota, if I'm pronouncing the name right. Not here? Okay. Check in. Um, <clears throat> so, Guillermo Piero, uh, if I'm pronouncing his name right. Guillermo, you left? Okay. Let's be present to win. Every number of people that didn't come here. Um, Anji Green? Wow. David Longnegger? Okay, there you go. Okay. I'll give you a choice of one of these books here. Thanks, everyone.